Hello and welcome to News Click. We have with us today writer Ms. Geeta Hariharan, and we're going to discuss with her the recent ban on the documentary film India's Daughter, and in fact, not just the ban on India's Daughter, but this whole sort of culture of banning that see really seems to be picking up in the recent past. Welcome to News Click, Geeta. Uh, Geeta, <coughs> first of all, the film India's Daughter. Uh, the fact that parliamentarians across party lines have come out and spoken in favor of this ban. How do you react to something like this? And in fact, what they're saying is that it's a disturbing social harmony. I mean, these are people who've, uh, th these are people who make some of the most regressive anti-women statements themselves. And in mm -hmm. fact, a lot of what the rapist is saying in the film is not very different from the statements yes, they've yes, made. Yes. So how do you react to something like this ban? I, I don't think it's just a question of parliamentarians. Uh, it across society, from the most powerful to the alleged uh, man or woman on the street, you're going to have um, multiple opinions about why banning should happen. Uh, in recent times, of course, we've been hearing about hurt sentiment. So we became the Republic of Hurt, and now we've effortlessly become the Republic of Banning. Now, one of the oldest reasons for banning has been that it shows India in a bad light. So clearly it's more important uh, uh, to do PR in the world at large than to keep your citizens um, safe. So the well-being of your citizens comes uh, second. And if you remember years back, uh, Satyajit Ray's films Absolutely. were Absolutely. criticized for showing uh, a rather unattractive India. So we citizens are not in the business of doing PR for incredible India. We want our real lives <laughs> to have uh, choices, to have well-being, uh, to have our rights as citizens, not protection as, as the patronizing, patriarchal uh, um, leaders tell us that women should be protected. No, we just need our rights. Uh, so I would say that whatever your reason, that a society which bans uh, films, books, music, food, uh, violates our rights. Because it's the, the two sets of rights we're talking about here. One is that of the cultural practitioner. Absolutely. To write, to make films. And it's impossible, uh, you know as a filmmaker, I know as a writer, that if we are not allowed to write or paint or talk about uh, all kinds of subjects in films. Judge the work of art as that. Judge the film, disagree with it, critique it, make your own film. Or it, if it offends you so deeply, don't see it. See the kind of film you want to. So that is not a, 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 a valid response to ban something because you disagree with it, because it's not what you would like to see and so on. So what happens then, you not only destroy the, the um, filmmaker's right or the writer's right to ask questions, to critique, to offend, because that's what you have to do as a cultural practitioner, but also the right of those you are making Absolutely. the film for. Absolutely. So we will never, never, never have a society where we can debate unless people are allowed to see films, are allowed to read books, and judge for themselves and debate. And in fact, I must point out that this particular film has created a, a, a certain sort of debate, which I think is important. Absolutely. So certain sort of issues have come out. You know, should we listen to the um, uh, the the uh, uh, the rapist, for example? You know, so it, it's. I think it's a good thing to debate these. You should we have a film like this made by uh, a non-Indian? But well, these are issues that we have to constantly discuss. Absolutely. But Absolutely. what really worries me, Nakul, is that this is not just about a film or about just uh, a, what is directly seen as cultural practice. What is really worrying is that it feeds into a whole pattern of banning. And that is not a pattern that we can ignore. In fact, what we're seeing then is, like you were saying, that it's not only the cultural practitioners or artists who are on the receiving end of this banning, but 
I mean, yes, that of course is happening in a very big way. Fifty Shades of Grey got banned recently. Shubhradeep's film on Muzaffar Nagar, in the room, Muzaffar Nagar is still stuck in the censors. But I mean, we've also seen a ban on beef. So you're not only going to be not, the state is not only deciding what we can watch or what we can make as artists; they're also deciding what we can eat. Absolutely. But before I come to that, if I may interrupt, I just want to point out mm -hmm. that um, you know this alleged logic of banning is is so skewed that. Slumdog Millionaire, for example, was not banned. And you could take, you know, the same logical process and say, well, look at this appalling poverty that the film shows. I mean, that the fact that I didn't think the film was much is, is, is a separate point. Absolutely. But I would mm -hmm. certainly defend its right to be uh, made and to be screened and then to be debated about why you think that this uh, presents poverty in a kind of feel-good way. But the point is that at at that time, it was astonishing that various people actually said, oh, this shows us how much poverty we have, which I found extraordinary that, uh, you know, in a city like Bombay, where you can't escape poverty. So why wasn't that bad? So that is there. But coming to your, uh, qu uh, you know, qu uh, query about uh, Maharashtra, I think this is really an important thing. And it may not seem easy to make a link between a film or a book and um, uh, the banning of beef. But I think it's part of the pattern. Absolutely. Um, in Maharashtra, in one week we've seen first the banning of beef and on the other hand, the uh, taking away of the reservation for Muslims in education. Absolutely. So, so mm. in one fell blow, you see with beef, not just telling you what to eat, which is ridiculous, but also livelihood issues that come up when you know we know which section of society which community is going to be the most affected and it is essentially dalits and muslims because I mean, exactly 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 mm -hmm. and then of course the education and here actually i i want to recall an experience i had as part of a public hearing in 2007 in ahmedabad this was a public hearing where survivors of 2002 uh, in gujarat came and spoke about their concerns what I found astonishing was 98% of the survivors were not recalling what happened to them. They were not staying there. They were talking about survival issues and what challenged them. And what challenged them? One was livelihood. And in fact, a lot of them spoke about transporting of meat from one part of the state to the other and how they, were, they had to pay bigger bribes and so on. That was one, livelihood issues, and the other was education. And in, interestingly, boys and girls, they spoke of the difficulty of getting admission in regular schools. They weren't even talking of madrasas. I say this because this is how you marginalize further, and there's a vacuum. And who's going to fill up this vacuum? It's going to be the conservative Muslims, the uh, right wing, it's, it's, it's going to be, so, you know, in, in effect, what you have is the diminishing to the old religious identity and you actually uh, end up creating what you claim there is. Because, I mean, clearly, because when you're saying that on the one hand, there's also been this, uh, they've, they've uh, revoked the 5% reservation that there was for Muslims in education and, and at the same time, there's a kind of a beef ban. So, there's clearly a larger ideological motive behind these bans. And it's not just happening in isolation or in a vacuum. And especially if you look at the Sachar Committee report, we'll know that it's actually criminal to take away that little reservation that there was for Muslims. But taking this uh, further, ultimately there hasn't been enough. And let's, it's also a fact that while there has been some sort of an outrage on the social media and so on, but that's been very minimal. There hasn't been enough of a protest. There hasn't been enough of an outrage by civil society in general against the bans as well. I mean, there has been some, there, there have been little pockets of resistance, but just pockets. You know, I am not so sure of that. Mm. Uh, I think there is a, a, a simmering rage because we are talking about, if you look at the last uh, just six months, mm. um, the rage that a, a whole lot of people felt, not just readers and writers, about what happened to Perumal Murugan. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, this was not just in India, it was all over the world because mm -hmm. for a writer to say, I am formally dead as a writer, what I'm saying here was a, a rooted writer uh, talking about uh, practices 
which probably happened. And even if they didn't, he's within his rights to invent them. That's how writers work. And, you know, to, to terrorize your writers, uh, it means that the society is, is you know, it, it's actually simmering with one kind of uh, chauvinism, uh, a completely unhealthy kind of uh, agenda in terms of debate uh, and cultural practice and freedom. And on the other hand, the more writers start retiring, uh, cultural practitioners in general start retiring, self, start self-censorship. So a ban does several things. And you know, when we say we are against bans, it's not a black and white issue. Of course, we continue to uh, underline the importance of censoring hate speech. This is why we have this concept called hate speech, which is quite different from this free-for-all banning. Banning, hounding people, uh, uh, and actually making sure that people do not feel free to uh, either express dissent in terms of their work or about banning. But I do think there is a simmering rage and there have just been too many bans for people not to take up, uh, uh, not to take notice. Uh, let's not forget that we're not even now uh, allowed to use the word lesbian. You know? Absolutely. The uh, and word this word is, I, yeah. I mean, not only, it, it's also stupid because if you don't use a word, it doesn't mean that the reality is not there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, when they do those beeps on television, for instance, uh, other than the fact that we're laughing our guts out at, at, at the words they used to replace it, it's not as if you can't fill in the blanks. So there seems to be, actually, it's insulting finally, because it's as if you are treating all Indian citizens as children yeah, we're who, all cannot, who mm. cannot see all kinds of villainy which exist, which we see all the time, which even our school children see all the time. And you say, we can't see it on the screen. We can't see it in books because then we might get corrupted. But thank you very much. We don't need your protection. We don't need you to ban for us. Just make sure that you restrain those who give vent to hate speech. But Gita, in fact, that, that was going to be my last question, and which is that somewhere when you're saying that there needs to be some amount of restrain or some degree of censorship when it comes to, say, hate speech. And we've seen some very vitriolic hate speech in, over the last few decades, actually, in India, uh, by, be it by Hindu, Hindutva right-wing fundamentalists or even someone like an Ovesi. Um, <clears throat> but then do we sort of start treading slightly dangerous ground? Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to understand this because finally one of the arguments being used against this film as well is that with the kind of space this film is giving the rapist is that you know you are allowing for some kind of hate speech against women and it, it actually then it sort of brings me back to my previous film which was about the Kaap Panchayats and a resistance against the Kaaps and against this kind of feudal patriarchy by young women but there was a lot of space we gave to the Kaap Panchayats now does that mean that the film is actually you know but but then that is actually a strong argument being used against this film no wait a minute hmm. uh, we mustn't confuse uh, different worlds hmm. you know uh, in the uh, world of a film or mm. in the world of a book, mm. uh, now I can't avoid, uh, uh, if I'm writing about uh, Hitler, um, I mean, he did a lot of hateful things. Right. It would be idiotic not to, but there is an entire world you've created. There's a worldview there. There's a context in which you are showing, look, this in, in, in India's daughter, for example, you're saying, look, this monstrous creature is not saying something completely different from his lawyer hmm. or from various other people. Hmm. But let me use just one instance of recent hate speech. Um, Adityanath was there when, uh, you know, this other uh, fellow gets up on stage and says that um, yeah. uh, uh, Muslim women, uh, Muslim women who are dead hmm. should be, their bodies should be exhumed hmm. and they should be raped. Hmm. Now, okay, it's both on women. Now, there it's very clear and they're it's not just it because the they're yeah. women hmm. but they're Muslim women hmm. so the hate speech there is very clear because it's an incitement hmm. to violence hmm. to hatred and therefore violence hmm. against Muslim women in particular hmm. so I think it's, whereas in the film they're actually countering what he's saying also by showing or at least it's, it's creating a, it's exactly. a whole context so it's a whole debate, debate because right, you know uh, we've been talking hmm. about all kinds of people have been using the word patriarchy hmm. 
um, so easily. Mm. But, you know, patriarchy, uh, uh, to look at how embedded it is in our society and how easily it comes out in so many different forms, not just in this kind of uh, black and monstrous form, but in all kinds of subtle forms and both from men and women. Absolutely. Because we're all part of the same system. Mm. So I, I think that, um, of course, these things are difficult, which is exactly why we need to debate. But I, I, I suspect that most of us can recognize hate speech when we hear it. It's, it's got to be seen in a context because sometimes documentary films against religious fundamentalism will also have that same hate speech, but then it's being used in a context. Of course, exactly. Of know, course. Yeah. You're saying this is what hate speech sounds, it sounds like, like, you know. Like, so, I mean, these these are issues that we've all dealt mm. with. Absolutely. As I, I wouldn't be able to write a novel and you wouldn't be able to make a film mm. if mm. we didn't show a range of, and sometimes it's not so black and white. Absolutely. You know, there's mm. a lot of grain between. Mm. Hmm. So, um, I, I, I don't think we can talk about uh, uh, hate speech, which is there directly to incite hatred, is quite different. And we have more than enough examples, and I suspect we've all learned to differentiate it from actually debating or creating your view of the world. Thank you so much, Geeta. Hmm. Here's with the hope that finally the ban culture is revoked or at least there's enough there's enough protest against it thank you so Absolutely. much